Welcome to the Anso Knife Shop. I'm Jens Anso, and today I'll take you through the beginning of the making of my zero folder. I'm grinding all the parts, fitting them together, fitting the blade lock. I think this was one of those lucky shots. It's rock solid. And finally, I do the blade grinding. I hope you enjoyed the episode. So the Zero uh, had its debut as a test lab outbreak. Test lab outbreak was a, a project that I was running back in the, what? I think I started in 2006, seven, and it ran until 2012, I think. I think. It was my way of, of doing prototype work. I would make a new design, test it out, by making five of each model. It allowed me to have a canvas to do some uh, experimenting with textures, blade grinds, materials, finishes. And um, I came up with the, the name Test Lab Outbreak as a catchy phrase to kind of embrace all of these new designs. About half of the Test Lab Outbreaks became regular models and they count some of my most popular models over time, the 67, the Haddock, the Zero, the Mojo. And um, now here in 2023, I thought it was, it was time to revive this old design. This is actually, uh, one of the rare cases of me reintroducing the what has become known in the industry as the Enso texture. I haven't done this for a number of years except for a few exceptions, but now this is the first time in, I don't know, eight, ten years. It's one of those textures that historically speaking is the one that where I put myself on fire the most times. I would grind these out on, on my trusted old horizontal grinder and it will throw sparks and titanium dust and the combination of those two things will make your day a little more interesting. Anyways, in, in, in this case, um, I decided that it, it was time to do the texture on the, on the CNC, which I really, I'm super excited about this mainly just because I don't have to put myself into flames to, to make the knives. I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> so what we're about to start now is um, finish grinding these parts. Here on the edges, you still have some, some tool marks from the CNC and um, I will work most of the surfaces and um, get them ready for the next step, which is fitting the lock. So now I got the majority of the finish ready for, for these parts for the next step, which is fitting the lock. Um, I have developed this special system for fitting my locks that requires a lot of precision work. One of uh, the features is not something that I came up with, but something that I incorporated a hardened steel insert into the frame. So it fits very precisely into the frame and is held in place by a screw here. What it does is it gives you a much better feel, a much better action for the lock. It holds the knife securely, but the disengagement of the lock is very smooth. Whereas traditional speaking, in custom knife making for a number of years, you would use a titanium frame and let that rest against the steel. But it has this one disadvantage that titanium likes to stick to steel, whereas hardened steel against hardened steel is buttery smooth. So the next step for this being a, this is a new model, I, I will scribe a line on the blade from the front of the, of the lock and then set my fixtures to, to meet that line perfectly. So there'll be a lot of 
walking back and forth, testing the, the fit of the lock. And when I'm 100% satisfied with the adjustment, I will mark those uh, numbers down and then I can repeat that same geometry for the, for the lock on, on uh, all the rest of these zeros. So next step is just doing a assembly of all the parts and scribing a line on the blade. Knife is put together. I'm testing that open and close fits as it should. I'm scribing the line with a exacto blade where I actually ground the the edge to be on the the reverse side of what it's normally. So it will allow me to scribe really close up against the, the lug insert. So this is um, one of my belt grinders um, that is set up for one specific purpose, and that is to grind the lug face of the blade. So this is a precision instrument. This little contraption here is actually a guard to protect not anyone walking past. Well, the tape here is to somewhat protect your skin or your belly, but it's actually to protect the, uh, the mechanism here. This is a precision um, machinery. I can adjust the angles. I can adjust the height, the depth, everything with these micrometers. And this allows me to adjust the lock face, the angle and the depth and log engagement by the thousands. This is, this is something I'm, I'm rather proud of, of having made. And it took me way longer than I care to admit to figure this out and to build. Uh, I ordered these Mitsutoyo micrometers from Japan, I think, and then took everything apart and, and tried to figure out exactly what I needed to get this to work. And it took the better part of a week just to make this setup. But having spent that time and invested that time in the process, it's so nice to have 100, 110% control of this process. Using hardened log insert requires in in my experience, a way higher tolerance than not using the hardened log insert, and, th and this setup will give me that. So now we we just grind roughly to where we need to be, and then I ease into it afterwards and and uh, put the knife together probably 10, 20 times in order to get the, the proper fit. Now, once that's established, I can redo all five knives for this batch and have them all within just a, a tiny amount of adjustment. So now I'm easing my way into the scribe line and ideally I want to see touching the line here and grinding half of the line away. And you won't be able to see that scribe line on the camera. I can somewhat see it with these on, but it's something where you really need to, to get the, the good goggles on. So now I'm actually grinding up against the stop so I don't even have to look. It won't grind off more until I adjust this small lever and I can just move my way into the grind or where I want to be with the grind very slowly. Adjusting this and, ad and adjusting this will give me the exact result that I need. Now it's time for me to do the first test assembly with the lock grind. I Hopefully I'm still a bit away from the final result, but now I'm starting to having a hard time actually seeing the scribe line. Scribing a line on hardened steel with a steel blade is not ideal. It, it's okay, but I, the line is not super sharp. So, on to a test assemble. Yeah. 
so what I'm looking for is log engagement. And at this point, it's not adjusted in any way. I'm just getting close to where I want it. So I'm, I'm seeing if the, the log will engage. It won't at this point, but I'm also checking with, with the light to see if I can see w how close we are. I can generally, I can tell by shining my, my lamp in and, and see if I will get more light in one end of the, the log insert than another. So, so that's what I'm looking for at the moment. What I do is I have a number of these log inserts in, in slight length variations. So even though I shoot above my desired goal, it's generally by a few thousands or hundreds. And again, uh, since I'm mainly in metric, it's a, a couple of hundreds of a millimeter that decides if it's a good log up or not. And that's not a whole lot. So precision to a certain point, and then I have uh, means to adjust afterwards. So now I'm, I'm just taking off a hair each time. So I'll walk back and forth, grind just a little bit off, reassemble, grind a little bit off, and then just sneak my, my way into the proper fit. And sometimes it's a lucky shot in a couple of uh, takes, and, uh, and sometimes it takes 20 uh, tries to get it just right. And then when you get it just right, there's some micro adjustment that's, that's, that may be needed. But, but usually this gives me a, a pretty good indication of of uh, where I should be. So now I don't have to pay much attention to what I'm doing because the uh, micro adjustment of the fixture takes care of that. Now I'm just gonna deburr this sharp edge right here because this will dig into both the log insert and, and, the, and the log bar itself if, uh, if not careful. This is while it's it's not a sharp edge, it's, it's a very sharp corner. So this just needs a little deburring. One Americano for Anas. One latte for Anso. And yeah, I drink latte. Knife making don't have to be all cruel, black, sour. Cold coffee, no, no, latte is the way to go. I'm man enough to admit that I prefer a latte. I don't have a count on, on which, which number of putting this knife back together and disassembling it for fine adjustment, but we're... I think the third or fourth? Yeah, something like that. As I mentioned earlier, this can take anywhere from a handful of times to 10, 15, 20 times, depending on how gently I move into things. So, Ooh. I think I think this was one of those lucky shots. It's rock solid. I did overshoot my ideal position by like a tiny fraction. So on this specific one, I will adjust by using a little longer log insert. The log up is good. And in some cases, this would be the ideal lock up. I prefer a little early lock up just because even though it's hardened steel again, hard, uh, against hardened steel, an early lockup is a super secure lockup, but it allows for a little wear and tear down the line of the lifetime of this knife. So rather than having a knife come back in say 10 years that needs a little adjustment, an early lockup will allow for a little more wear on the, on the parts before you need to send it in. Actually, I take I take this back. This is, has the perfect lock up. Let's just. Actually, I don't take that back. This needs to be dialed back five hundredths of a millimeter. 
which in fraction is, I have absolutely no idea. So for this specific one, I will change the log insert to the next step up. And for the next four, I will adjust my dials back five hundredths of a millimeters, maybe four. If you want to support this channel, please visit my website. There's a link below. On my website, you can find the Enso knife tool here in the PVD version and in the brass version. This is the exact action that I was looking for, like the perfect lock up, rock solid, and the, the engagement is right where I prefer it, which is roughly one third of the lock and search width. So the engagement is approximately one third of the lock insert, which is two millimeter thick. So one third means it's 0.7 millimeter engagement with the with the blade, roughly. That's uh, that's to me is the ideal spot. I will have a level of engagement from from low to medium, and where I feel comfortable within a certain level of engagement. But this is this is right on the money of on what I prefer. You need a super strong, safe but still with some, with some uh, adjustment available and some, some wear and tear won't leave the, the knife in a, in a poor state. Next up is fitting the detent. The detent is a steel ball sitting in the frame that will fit into a hole drilled in the blade so that when you close the, the blade, the detent holds the blade shut. I have a few different techniques that I use when in fitting the detent and being this is a new model, I need to figure out exactly what needs to be done and what needs to, to happen next up. So the way I construct my knives generally, I have, I can use the backspacer as a guide for setting the detent, but uh, I just want to make 100% sure that this is the case with with this model as well. Depending on the size of the blade and the dimensions of the frame, there's some variations that I need to take into account before just doing what I usually do. Incidentally, the, the Zero has a 85 millimeter blade, that's three and a quarter, three and a half inch, which to me is the sweet spot for almost any knife that I prefer to carry, I will carry a smaller knife, but a three and a half inch blade, three and a quarter inch blade is a super functional, but still very manageable size that will do just about any job that you can expect from a, a folding knife. I put a, a can twist clamp on here and these are the best. I have these in various sizes where the two inch is one of the larger ones and they, has, have, they have just proved to be such an important tool in my shop. I probably have, I don't know, 40, 50 in various sizes and, and it's, as the name says, can't twist. It will apply a lot of pressure in one place without any twisting just a super nice tool. Add a little cutting fluid to the hole. And this, this drill press here is, is just such a beauty. It's, I would guess without knowing exactly that it's from the 70s or probably more like 60s. And I use it for this specific job only is to drill the detent ball or detent hole in the blade. It's built like a tank and it I have reduced the speed to its current 3500 4000 rpm but it's built to actually run 19000 rpm and it was a little it was a little much for for my needs so 
I reduced the speed, but it's, it's a fantastic machine. And it was one of those lucky shots on Craigslist or the Danish equivalent to Craigslist, $200, actually less. It was one of those cases where the guy I bought this machine from knew what he had, but he also knew that this type of, of drill press is such a specific piece of tool that it would be not the most easy thing to sell. So knowing that I would put this to good use for a number of years, I bought this maybe 15 years ago. He was just so happy that I would put this to such good use that I have been doing. And because it was a treasure for him, but he just didn't have the need for it anymore. So actually meeting people who understands that passion and desire for something like this is something that you can't really put that into a, into a fixed price that would equal the worth. So it's a machine that while I only paid roughly $200 for it, I would have paid 10 times that if I knew now 15 years later how much joy I got out of, of having it. And once it comes time for me to sell it, I would most likely sell it at, 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 an, at, an, at an equal price to that, to somebody who would, would actually love to have this machine in the shop. But for now it stays right here. Now I just drilled the detent ball hole in the blade. And I'm gonna test it with a detent just to see if it locks up as I like it to. When the blade is closed, the detent needs to suck the blade into the closed position. If the, the detent hole in the blade is located wrong, you can actually feel a little wiggle room in there and there should be no, there should be no wiggle room whatsoever. So now I just preset the ball into the frame just <clears throat> ever so slightly. The fit is press fit. The ball is press fit into the frame. Um, but I want to be able to remove the ball for the next process. So now I just set it r really high in the frame, but it will allow me to actually test if it, if it works or not and still give me enough material to press fit the ball all the way in. One thing is your, the visual response to whatever I'm doing, but also the feel. So if you notice, I was just I'm very much focused on how it feels and how it sounds. If it sounds good, it's probably good. If it doesn't sound good, it's probably bad. This feels good and it sounds good, so the detent is, is set perfectly. So if you notice that when I close the blade, at some point the detent will drag the blade shut. And that keeps the blade from, from opening up. The level of success that I feel when everything just goes together is like, oh, feels so good. Just, oh. because even though I've been doing this for so many years, there's always that tiny bit of doubt if I was actually able to, to pull this off. So when, when everything just works as I had hoped and as I planned, oh, the justification of that is just, mm. So next up is finish grinding the blade. So right now I moved to my hardcore grinder with the Moen flat platen here. And I have to tell you that this machine, for one thing, but this, this flat platen here specifically basically saved my career. Five, six years ago, I developed this horrible pain in my right hand after a, what, 20 years of grinding 
uh, thousands of blades. I started having a severe pain in the, in the joint here to a point where I could hardly grind anything. I would tape up my hand to it almost looked like a boxing glove um, just to be able to grind. Everything was held in hand and at that point it made really a lot of sense that I was doing all that to me now uh, having a consistency between two knives of the same model means a whole lot more. This platen here allows me to grind on a continuously basis for hours and hours and hours without the same strain to, to my hands. So this setup here uh, allows me to keep a fixed angle between the grinder and the blade. This being a new model, um, I need to adjust this setup again like when we adjusted the uh, log insert, just walk it in just very slightly and then when I, when I get to the right angle, this is where I need to be for, for all, the following, all the following blades. But I can't speak highly enough about this, uh, this setup here. I did some modification to it, which is kind of a, um, a marker for me. I, I, I don't shy back from modifying even expensive equipment, so it just works 5% better for my needs or 10 or 20% better. In this case, I got rid of some of the attachment on this platen here and again used a can twist clamp to hold the blade. Just works a little better for my needs. But this setup here, while this platen alone was actually more expensive than the rest of the machine, it, it's worth every penny. So now I'm, I'm setting the platen so it will meet the top and bottom of the grind evenly. So I'm not moving the, uh, the grind here in any way. So I want to, the grind bevel here to meet the finishing belt very precisely. So for that, I'm just moving the belt by hand just to establish the exact right angle. And it's pretty much it's pretty much there now, just a tiny adjustment and we should be good to go. So what I'm looking for now is perfect symmetry of the shoulders. The shoulders are where the grind starts and you're shaping the edge. So. What I want is perfect symmetry from side to side of the shoulders. And it's pretty damn close. Just need a, needs a little more work and, and we're good. Now I moved up to a 600 grit belt, which is where I will stop the process on the grinding machine. And from here on out, it's hand finishing. Um, what I do here is make sure that I take all tool marks, all grind marks below 600 grit away, which will allow me to make a beautiful hand finished satin that uh, is not going to take me several days to, to reach, but hopefully, hopefully no more than 20 minutes, 30 minutes. But, um, making sure that the work on the grinder is, is good, solid and consistent makes the next process much easier. And that actually goes for most everything in what I do and most everything in knife making. If you are sure to be consistent with each step and that you are 100% aware of what you are trying to achieve, then the next step will be much easier. And in this case, the next step is, is hand sanding the blade. Any grit above or below 600, it will show immediately. So since I know that I will resume this process tomorrow, 
just wrote 600 on that side and 320 on that side. Since we won't be able to finish this today and I will have tons of other stuff in the process tomorrow. This is just a, a good idea to just make some notes for yourself. I am super, super excited about building this knife. There's a, a couple of new aspects of, of knife making for me in this build. For instance, the bringing back the Enso texture in my custom work, which I'm super excited about. So. This concludes this episode. Uh, for now, it will be continued. We'll talk more about the Zero folder. If you liked what you saw today, remember to subscribe, hit like, leave me a comment. I would love to hear your thoughts about uh, what you've seen here. Until next time, see you later. If you enjoyed this episode, please visit my website at answerofdenmark.com. Help support this channel and keep the light on. On my website, you can find cool products like the Enso Sheepsfoot.